the breadth of my shoulders as it were a peg to bang the coat on. We worship not the graces, nor the parse, but fashion. She spins and weaves and cuts with full authority. The head monkey at Paris puts on a traveler's cap, and all the monkeys in America do the same. I sometimes despair of getting anything quite simple and honest done in this world by the help of men. They would have to be passed through a powerful press first, to squeeze their old notions out of them, so that they would not so soon get upon their legs again, and then there would be some one in the company with a maggot in his head, hatched from an egg deposited there nobody knows when, for not even fire kills these things, and you would have lost your labor. Nevertheless, we will not forget that some Egyptian wheat was handed down to us by a mummy. On the whole, I think that it cannot be maintained that dressing has in this or any country risen to the dignity of an art. At present men make shift to wear what they can get. Like shipwrecked sailors they put on what they can find on the beach, and at a little distance, whether of space or time, laugh at each other's masquerade. Every generation laughs at the old fashions, but follows religiously the new. We are amused at beholding the costume of Henry the Eighth or Queen Elizabeth, as much as if it was that of the king and queen of the cannibal islands. All costume off a man is pitiful or grotesque. It is only the serious eye peering from and the sincere life passed within it which restrain laughter and consecrate the costume of any people. Let Harlequin be taken with a fit of the colic, and his trappings will have to serve that mood too. When the soldier is hit by a cannonball, rags are as becoming as purple. The childish and savage taste of men and women for new patterns keeps how many shaking and squinting through kaleidoscopes that they may discover the particular figure which this generation requires today. The manufacturers have learned that this taste is merely whimsical, of two patterns which differ only by a few threads more or less of a particular color, the one will be sold readily, the other lie on the shelf, though it frequently happens that after the lapse of a season the latter becomes the more fashionable. Comparatively, tattooing is not the hideous custom which it is called. It is not barbarous merely because the printing is skin-deep and unalterable. I cannot believe that our factory system is the best mode by which men may get clothing. The condition of the operatives is becoming every day more like that of the English, and it cannot be wondered at, since, as far as I have heard or observed, the principal object is not that mankind may be well and honestly clad, but unquestionably that corporations may be enriched. In the long run, men hit only what they aim at. Therefore, though they should fail immediately, they had better aim at something high. As for a shelter, I will not deny that this is now a necessary of life, though there are instances of men having done without it for long periods in colder countries than this. Samuel Lang says that, quote, the Laplander in his skin dress, and in a skin bag which he puts over his head and shoulders, will sleep night after night on the snow, in a degree of cold which would extinguish the life of one exposed to it in any woolen clothing." End quote. He had seen them asleep thus, yet he adds, quote, they are not hardier than other people. End quote. But probably the man did not live long on the earth without discovering the convenience which there is in a house, the domestic comforts, which phrase may have originally signified the satisfactions of the house more than of the family, though these must be extremely partial and occasional in those climates where the house is associated in our thoughts with winter, or the rainy season chiefly, and two-thirds of the year 
except for a parasol, is unnecessary. In our climate, in the summer, it was formerly almost solely a covering at night. In the Indian gazettes, a wigwam was the symbol of a day's march, and a row of them, cut or painted on the bark of a tree, signified that so many times they had camped. Man was not made so large-limbed and robust, but that he must seek to narrow his world and wall in a space such as fitted him. He was at first bare and out of doors, but though this was pleasant enough in serene and warm weather, by daylight, the rainy season and the winter, to say nothing of the torrid sun, would perhaps have nipped his race in the bud if he had not made haste to clothe himself with the shelter of a house. Adam and Eve, according to the fable, wore the bower before other clothes. Man wanted a home, a place of warmth or comfort, first of warmth, then the warmth of the affections. We may imagine a time when, in the infancy of the human race, some enterprising mortal crept into a hollow in a rock for shelter. Every child begins the world again to some extent, and loves to stay outdoors even in wet and cold. It plays house as well as horse, having an instinct for it. Who does not remember the interest with which, when young, he looked at shelving rocks or any approach to a cave? It was the natural yearning of that portion, any portion of our most primitive ancestor which still survived in us. From the cave we have advanced to roofs of palm leaves, of bark and boughs, of linen woven and stretched, of grass and straw, of boards and shingles, of stones and tiles. At last we know not what it is to live in the open air, and our lives are domestic in more senses than we think. From the hearth the field is a great distance. It would be well, perhaps, if we were to spend more of our days and nights without any obstruction between us and the celestial bodies. If the poet did not speak so much from under a roof, or the saint dwell there so long. Birds do not sing in caves, nor do doves cherish their innocence in dovecots. However, if one designs to construct a dwelling-house, it behooves him to exercise a little Yankee shrewdness, lest, after all, he find himself in a workhouse, a labyrinth without a clue, a museum, an almshouse, a prison, or a splendid mausoleum instead. Consider first how slight a shelter is absolutely necessary. I have seen Penobscot Indians in this town living in tents of thin cotton cloth, while the snow was nearly a foot deep around them, and I thought that they would be glad to have it deeper to keep out the wind. Formerly, when how to get my living honestly, with freedom left for my proper pursuits, was a question which vexed me even more than it does now, for unfortunately I am become somewhat callous, I used to see a large box by the railroad six feet long by three wide, in which the laborers locked up their tools at night, and it suggested to me that every man who has hard pushed might get such a one for a dollar, and, having bored a few auger holes in it, to admit the air at least, get into it when it rained and at night, and hook down the lid, and so have freedom in his love, and in his soul be free. This did not appear the worst, nor by any means a despicable alternative. You could sit up as late as you pleased, and whenever you got up, go abroad without any landlord or house-lord dogging you for rent. Many a man is harassed to death to pay the rent of a larger and more luxurious box, who would not have frozen to death in such a box as this. I am far from jesting. Economy is a subject which admits of being treated with levity, but I cannot so be disposed of. A comfortable house for a rude and hardy race, that lived mostly out of doors, was once made here almost entirely of such materials as nature furnished ready to their hands. Gukin, 
who was superintendent of the Indians, subject to the Massachusetts colony, writing in 1674, says, quote, The best of their houses are covered very neatly, tight and warm, with barks of trees, slipped from their bodies at those seasons when the sap is up, and made into great flakes with pressure of weighty timber when they are green. The meaner sort are covered with mats, which they make of a kind of bulrush, and are also indifferently tight and warm, but not so good as the former. Some I have seen sixty or a hundred feet long, and thirty feet broad. I have often lodged in their wigwams, and found them as warm as the best English houses. End quote. He adds that they were commonly carpeted, and lined within with well-wrought embroidered mats, and were furnished with various utensils. The Indians had advanced so far as to regulate the effect of the wind by a mat suspended over the hole in the roof, and moved by a string. Such a lodge was in the first instance constructed in a day or two at most, and taken down and put up in a few hours, and every family owned one, or its apartment in one. End of chapter 1 LibriVox Part 2 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Gordon Mackenzie. Walden by Henry David Thoreau. Chapter 1 Economy. LibriVox Part 3. In the savage state, every family owns a shelter as good as the best, and sufficient for its coarser and simpler wants. But I think that I speak within bounds when I say that, though the birds of the air have their nests, and the foxes their holes, and the savages their wigwams, in modern civilized society not more than one-half the families own a shelter. In the large towns and cities, where civilization especially prevails, the number of those who own a shelter is a very small fraction of the whole. The rest pay an annual tax for this outside garment of all, become indispensable summer and winter, which would buy a village of Indian wigwams, but now helps to keep them poor as long as they live. I do not mean to insist here on the disadvantage of hiring compared with owning, but it is evident that the savage owns his shelter because it costs so little, while the civilized man hires his commonly because he cannot afford to own it, nor can he in the long run any better afford to hire. But answers one, by merely paying this tax, the poor civilized man secures an abode which is a palace compared with the savages. An annual rent of from twenty-five to a hundred dollars, these are the country rates, entitles him to the benefit of the improvements of centuries, spacious apartments, clean paint paper, Rumford fireplace, plastering, Venetian blinds, copper pump, spring lock, a commodious cellar, and many other things. But how happens it that he who is said to enjoy these things is so commonly a poor civilized man, while the savage who has them not is rich as a savage? If it is asserted that civilization is a real advance in the condition of man, and I think that it is, Though only the wise improve their advantages, it must be shown that it has produced better dwellings without making them more costly. And the cost of a thing is the amount of what I will call life which is required to be exchanged for it, immediately or in the long run. An average house in this neighborhood costs, perhaps, eight hundred dollars, and to lay up this sum, 
will take from ten to fifteen years of the laborer's life, even if he is not encumbered with a family. Estimating the pecuniary value of every man's labor at one dollar a day, for if some receive more, others receive less, so that he must have spent more than half his life, commonly, before his wigwam will be earned. If we suppose him to pay a rent instead, this is but a doubtful choice of evils. Would the savage have been wise to exchange his wigwam for a palace on these terms? It may be guessed that I reduce almost the whole advantage of holding this superfluous property as a fund in store against the future, so far as the individual is concerned, mainly to the defraying of funeral expenses, but perhaps a man is not required to bury himself. Nevertheless, this points to an important distinction between civilized man and the savage, and no doubt they have designs on us for our benefit in making the life of a civilized people an institution in which the life of the individual is to a great extent absorbed in order to preserve and perfect that of the race. But I wish to show at what a sacrifice this advantage is at present obtained, and to suggest that we may possibly so live as to secure all the advantage without suffering any of the disadvantage. What mean ye by saying that the poor ye have always with you, or that the fathers have eaten sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge? As I live, saith the Lord God, ye shall not have occasion any more to use this proverb in Israel. Behold, all souls are mine, as the soul of the Father, so also the soul of the Son is mine. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. When I consider my neighbors, the farmers of Concord, who are at least as well off as the other classes, I find that for the most part they have been toiling twenty, thirty, or forty years that they may become the real owners of their farms, which commonly they have inherited with encumbrances, or else bought with hired money, and we may regard one-third of that toil as the cost of their houses, but commonly they have not paid for them yet. It is true. The encumbrances sometimes outweigh the value of the farm, so that the farm itself becomes one great encumbrance, and still a man is found to inherit it, being well acquainted with it, as he says. On applying to the assessors, I am surprised to learn that they cannot at once name a dozen in the town who own their farms free and clear. If you would know the history of these homesteads, inquire at the bank where they are mortgaged. The man who has actually paid for his farm with labor on it is so rare that every neighbor can point to him. I doubt if there are three such men in Concord. What has been said of the merchants, that a very large majority, even ninety-seven in a hundred, are sure to fail, is equally true of the farmers. With regard to the merchants, however, one of them says pertinently that a great part of their failures are not genuine pecuniary failures, but merely failures to fulfill their engagements, because it is inconvenient. That is, it is the moral character that breaks down. But this puts an infinitely worse face on the matter, and suggests, besides, that probably not even the other three succeed in saving their souls, but are perchance bankrupt in a worse sense than they who fail honestly. <coughs> Bankruptcy and repudiation are the springboards from which much of our civilization vaults and turns its somersets. But the savage stands on the unelastic plank of famine. Yet the Middlesex cattle show goes off here with eclat annually, as if all the joints of the agricultural machine were suent. 
the farmer is endeavoring to solve the problem of a livelihood by a formula more complicated than the problem itself. To get his shoestrings, he speculates in herds of cattle. With consummate skill he has set his trap with a hair spring to catch comfort and independence, and then, as he turned away, got his own leg into it. This is the reason he is poor, and for a similar reason we are all poor in respect to a thousand savage comforts, though surrounded by luxuries. As Chapman sings, quote, The false society of men for earthly greatness all heavenly comforts rarefies to air. And when the farmer has got his house, he may not be the richer, but the poorer for it, and it be the house that has got him. As I understand it, that was a valid objection urged by Momus against the house which Minerva made, that she, quote, had not made it movable, by which means a bad neighborhood might be avoided, end quote. And it may still be urged, for our houses are such unwieldy property that we are often imprisoned rather than housed in them, and the bad neighborhood to be avoided is our own scurvy selves. I know one or two families, at least, in this town, who for nearly a generation have been wishing to sell their houses in the outskirts and move into the village, but have not been able to accomplish it and only death will set them free. Granted that the majority are able at last either to own or hire the modern house with all its improvements. While civilization has been improving our houses, it has not equally improved the men who okay. to inhabit them. It has created palaces, yeah. but it was not okay. so easy to create noblemen yeah. and kings. And if the civilized man's good pursuits are no worthier than the oh, savages, yeah. if he is employed the greater oh, part yeah, of his buddy. life in obtaining gross necessaries and comforts I merely, why should he have a better dwelling than the former? But how do the poor minority fare? Perhaps it will be found that just when... How do you pause the box? Just be that pause? Be not pause. That degraded below him. The luxury of one class. Man, I want to show you something, bro. Well, sir. On another. On the one side is the palace. On the other. Be. Are the alms house. Bad and broski. Finer tools. That's like. Pause. The myriad who built the pyramids to be the tombs of the pyramids. Ah, oh, there we go. Oh. My guy. Video or your screen? Yeah, I'm gonna share my screen. You can actually do nine of Oh, we don't even have your screen. Oh. Hey. Wait, what's that one? Holy mackerel. Dude, this is so good. I have to restart my whole router, bro. How do you Yeah, I don't know. Was working absolutely fine yesterday. I'm gonna do a speed test. Uh, but my fiber. Is... Dude, I'm typing on a really big keyboard right now. So cool. And head on to Google and do a speed test. 
Tell me when you when you do put your screen out so I can click it. I'm making coffee and shit. Yeah, yeah, it won't be for a little while, bro. I'm gonna troubleshoot this. A weed guy had a, a quest box in his house, and his like his wife and daughter, they were all, they all really enjoyed it, I guess. Nice. I was like, I'm like, is it good enough? They're like, yeah, it's fine, it's great. Might disappear for a sec, bro. Alright, I'm here until I die. Cool. Perfect. Up the eight or something, five one. Rooter, bro. Oh, wait, hold on. It may be, we're not beasts of the herb themselves. The mason who finishes the cornice of the palace returns at night, perchance, to a hut not so good as a wigwam. It is a mistake to suppose that, in a country where the usual evidences so, of civilization exist, Yo, the condition of a very large mind. body of the so, inhabitants may too? not okay. be as I'm degraded just uh, trying as to that of get savages. into my headset, man. I refer to the degraded poor. Are you doing like VR development? Degraded rich. Um, more VR pro like you know this, bit, uh, media production. Not need to look farther than oh, okay. the shanties, which everywhere Do they have the editing elders. software that available now for that? Civilization. Where do um, I see in my daily work, kinda. Like I'm, I'm, I'm gonna try and share my screen in a sec. All winter with an open door for the sake of light. You see, bro. Imaginable. You're like my Wi Fi. Oh, yeah, bro. It is like dropping. I need to just restart my router. Poor things all tuck it out. We've been doing some crazy stuff in, in VR, man. Is fair to look this one game called Mio's. Yeah, that's really becoming this generation are a big uh, focus point now. Such too, yeah, bro. To a greater or less extent, now that headsets are more accessible and coming down in cost and shit like that. In England, which Definitely. Is the great in the world. We're still waiting on the killer app, though, right? I could refer you to Ireland. They were there. Which is marked as one right. of the white or enlightened spots. Yeah. Killer rap is when you yes. kill it's called killer rapper. Kill rapper. North American Indian Fucking shit. Or the South. <laughs> Rulers are as wise.
rise as the average Diagnostic. of civilized rulers. Diagnostic. Their condition Running. only proves squalidness may consist. I hardly need refer now to the laborers in our southern states who produce the staple exports of this country and are themselves a staple production of the South. But to confine myself to those who are fed in moderate circumstances, most men appear never to have considered what a house is. Who is that? And are actually needlessly poor all their lives. What's that? Because good morning, good evening, good afternoon, whatever it may be. Oh, hey, Mike. Such a one as their is that Mikey? Hey, now. Hey, now. It doesn't know how late you were up last night. <laughs> Any sort of coat oh, dude. which the tailor might cut out. Mikey! Yeah, was. Or gradually leaving off palm leaf hat or. Um, the thing is, I might disappear in a second. I hope, hopefully not. I'm trying to fix my internet. It's like, it's like, it feels like it's being throttled. You know, like when.